Georgina, the first thing I welcome today, and uh, the first thing I wanted to ask you was, I know that you're not a fan of the word sustainable. Would you like to expand? <laughs> Um, yes, of course. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for having me. I'm super thrilled to be at my first literary festival uh, talking with the book. So this is very special for me. Um, yeah, I set up Pebble um, back in 2016. And even then we were talking about what was sustainable, what was ethical and what was eco friendly in terms of products and services. And I just thought for me, the word sustainable doesn't really work in terms of capturing the kind of excitement and the innovation and the opportunities that I think are there um, in terms of a sort of more greener way of living. It always sounds a bit boring to me, the word sustainable. And in nowadays, um, you can also see it being used in greenwashing an awful lot. So people are sort of sticking that word in front of everything. And really, there's no legal definition um, when, it, when it applies to a product or a service. So it's now being used in a way to sell products that perhaps aren't as green as as you hope they are or you're led to believe so sustainable is a tricky one it kind of in one way means nothing and in another way it can mean anything and everything um and for me one of the reasons i started pebble was because i just was so blown away by all the different people around the world you know making incredible changes and inventing products and coming up with with amazing ways to kind of solve our, our climate emergency and that's not being shouted about enough and to kind of reduce that all down into one word, um, that, that sort of word sustainable, I just felt like was, was also doing them a disservice. So yeah, for me, it's, it's a problematic word. And also we don't have a bigger vocabulary around these issues. We need to get a bigger vocabulary because we end up just describing stuff as sustainable or ethical when actually it can mean so many different other things and what we mean by it can be, can be so different. So yeah, we need, we need a better vocabulary basically. Yes, I think it's a bit of a catch-all phrase, isn't it, which gets bandied about, really. Um, one of the things that you talk about in the book is clothing. Uh, I know there's been a sort of, there's a sort of fad for fast fashion over the last decade, but also now more people actually recycling um, their clothing and fashion. So perhaps you could give us some tips on how to be a bit greener. Certainly. So, of course. So, um, you know, I think over the last few decades, we've we've all bought for fast fashion and sort of thought about price and convenience when we buy our clothes and kind of been lulled into that sort of false cost of clothing. Um, I don't know if anyone here will have seen a documentary called True Cost, which goes into sort of um, the resources and the energy and the, the human crafts that, that, you know, a piece of clothing really takes. Um, but the amount of clothing as well has become a huge problem. So I think we get through something like 140 billion bits of clothing a year that's 11 pieces for every single person on the planet, new pieces every year. So you can kind of see the amount, you know, in my head, it's a mountain, you know, getting bigger and bigger. And a lot of time, um, the, 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 the materials and the toxic dyes that we use mean that, that those bits of clothing won't biodegrade in a way that they would have done a couple of hundred years ago. So we are creating an enormous problem for ourselves. Um, but also clothing is an area that can easily be fixed. We can, we can all adopt a greener wardrobe and it doesn't always have to come at a bigger price tag. I know, um, you know, one of the big hurdles for perhaps living a more greener lifestyle is price um, and especially when it comes to clothing. But there are so many alternatives now rather than just going out and buying greener versions of what you've already got in terms of the, the bartering, the swapping, the mending, the vintage clothing, the charity shop shopping, all of which, you know, we can do in a, in a fashion online now. I think there are so many other ways um, for us to have a wardrobe rather than just going out and buying new all the time. Um, I did a, a workshop on this last year and I was doing some research and they were saying um, the buzz you get from a new bit of clothing actually only lasts three days. So you, you get something, you know, you, you've bought it and then you want something else. And unfortunately, that kind of um, that kind of lifestyle that we've all been leading is, is causing huge, huge environmental problems. So anything we can do to reduce how much clothing we're buying and what we're buying and how we get rid of it is, is really helpful. Um, so the book goes into lots of different materials, um, what sort of materials you should be looking for. Um, about 65 percent of our clothing worldwide is synthetic. So it's made with oil or it it's, um, includes plastics. 
we have a big plastics problem. We know that, you know, we know about microplastics now and a lot of that comes from our clothing. Um, so the book talks you all through that um, and different materials and then also sort of what you to look for when you're looking for a more ethical, sustainable clothing. You're going to hear me use those words throughout the workshop because I also don't always have the words uh, to not use them. One of the things I noticed reading reading the book, um, I've often wondered what happens to clothing when it goes into a textile bank. And it talked about clothing being shredded and used for things like padding out car seats in new cars, which I had no idea about. Yeah, so there's a whole um, there's a whole industry and system behind clo you know, clothes recycling. When you put your clothes in a clothes bank, um, they basically get sent to so some big um, recycling and sorting centres. A lot of them are in London, and the clothes um, get sort of uh, graded and assessed basically so they'll get sent off to different charity shops if they're sort of top grade if they're middle grade they might get sent abroad um, a lot of them end up in Africa at the moment um, which is also can be problematic um, shoes get paired up and sold on and things like that but then for clothes that are really soiled and can't be mended and there's just no value in anyone wearing them they all get shredded and used for yeah things like car seat fillers and stuff so there's always a good reason to to recycle your clothes even if you don't think they're wearable anymore yeah, I have to admit, I had to fill in a questionnaire about clothing the other day and it asked, have you got any clothing that you've only worn once? And yes, I do. Not much, but yes. And that's, it's not good, is it? It's not good at all. Well, I think there's there's different ways to look at it, aren't there? Because everyone's going to have that occasion where, you know, maybe a dress you bought for a wedding or a suit you wore once. Um, and it's a case of, you know, if you've got it, keep it. Um, if it still fits, you know, there's this idea about, <laughs> yeah, no, none of mine does like that. <laughs> Sadly, it no. It's a a wedding, a wedding outfit, but no. <laughs> um, but there's a huge market now in, in selling secondhand clothing online um, with, with platforms like Depop and eBay and all those things. So there's always going to be another market for it. You can always sell it on if you don't want to donate it to a charity shop um, or to see if someone else can use it. I think the only thing I, I really struggle with still is shoes. And there is no way really to, to recycle shoes at the minute mm. um but there just isn't unless they're kind of pretty new and, and they can be reworn by someone else um and that's something that people ask us a lot about at the minute and and there isn't there isn't a system for recycling them right okay do you think that will change in the future i hope so i, I definitely hope so and there's there's been a huge boom in um shoe brands starting up that are creating shoes that either break down naturally into their various components and are using less plastic and less chemicals or can be recycled and amended more easily. Um, mm. So shoes are a bit like those, you know, how like electronics and cars have got ever more complicated until we can't fix them ourselves. Mm. Trainers, modern trainers and things are very similar. So there's a lot of companies sort of going back to basics using either leather or, you know, vegan alternatives. Um, so yeah, it's it's shoes are a bit of a bugbear for me at the minute. Mm, mm. Um, I want to take you into the kitchen now, um, which is just behind me here. Um, wanted a conversation really about washing up, the dreaded washing up. Now I don't have room for a dishwasher, uh, but I'm not sure whether I'd have one even if I did have the room. Because is it greener to use a dishwasher, or is it greener to wash up by hand? It's funny, um, this has been one of those questions that every single person that reads the book brings up. And I never knew that dishwashing and washing up was such a universal like argument between people. Um, and apparently I've settled several arguments in households uh, in the last couple of months, which makes me really happy. Um, but actually, if you're using a dishwasher and you're using it on an eco setting and you're filling it up, then a dishwasher is actually greener. Um, modern dishwashers use around 25 litres of water um, per cycle and actually when we're washing up we use around nine litres of water a minute which is huge when you when you start to think about it and most people when they're washing up might use up to 100 litres you just don't realise you turn the tap on even if you're quite conscious about not running the tap for a long time um, so yeah it really does make a huge difference and actually even things like pre-rinsing your dishes, which we might have grown up thinking that was the right thing to do. If you stop pre-rinsing your dishes, it can save up to 27,000 litres of water a year. 
So if you're paying for water as well on a meter, it's going to have an impact. Um, so yeah, there's a there's a couple of caveats. Obviously, you know, make sure that dishwasher is full, run it on the most eco setting, and see if you can be using sort of plant based detergents or um, start ordering your dishwasher tablets from different companies that don't use plastic. And there's a lot more of them now that deliver to home. Um, so yeah, there's there's a few different ways, but dishwasher is is actually greener. Right. Well, I'll have to wait till I get my next house because I just physically haven't got room for one, unfortunately. Never mind. <laughs> we got our first one like two years ago and it's, yeah, um, I never thought we'd have room, but we, we've suddenly got one. And um, mm. yeah, it's, it's it makes me feel happy using it now. <laughs> yeah. And do you have to use it on the eco setting for it to be more sustainable or does that not matter? Then? So the eco setting helps because it uses less water. So if you're looking at water and energy usage, um, which is what we're sort of looking at to, to assess whether it's greener, then yeah, the eco setting would, it wouldn't make the whole difference, but it, it certainly makes a big difference. Right, okay. Okay, so moving to the bathroom and having read your book, I've promptly ordered myself some uh, shampoo and conditioner bars so that I'm oh, using hooray. less plastic. I know, <laughs> I'm gonna try those, yeah. Seeing as I've just talked to my partner into using conditioner recently, he's now slightly worried that I'm chasing, changing the product. But <laughs> how can we make our bathrooms, you know, zero waste really? Because when you look around your bathroom cupboard, there's an awful lot of packaging that probably can't be re recycled which is a bit of a concern. So bathrooms weirdly are a bit of a blind spot or have been for us um, over the last few years. You know, we've, we're all quite, well, I'd say most people, you know, have uh, think about plastics when they go shopping or perhaps in their kitchen, but in the bathroom, it seems to have completely passed us by until recently. Um, so about only about 50% of people in Britain recycle the plastic in their bathroom. But when you think about the shower gel bottles and the shampoo and the conditioner and the soaps and the toothpaste and everything else, that's an awful lot of plastic um so we go through something like 264 million toothbrushes um over in the states they go through a billion razors I mean, this is per year this is this is huge um women go through around 11,000 sanitary products um in their lifetime so all of these amounts of plastic sort of add up and but actually the bathroom is one of the easiest places to make swaps there are a huge amount now of um, plastic free skincare and hair care and some other toiletry brands, um, whether you're looking at toothpaste that comes in an aluminium tube, um, recyclable toothbrush heads for electric toothbrushes or bamboo toothbrushes, the, the, the hard bar shampoos and conditioners that, that you mentioned, um, which are brilliant and things like that just make the swap so easy because actually when you're using one of those hard bar um, shampoos you're actually sort of taking out two plastic bottles of shampoo um, sort of out of the system so you can immediately see it start to add up um, and there are so many things that we have in our bathroom that can be adjusted you know like um, ordering you know loo roll from someone like who gives a crap who come in like big boxes rather than covered in plastic um, using re going back to using safety razors rather than the the disposable razors um, so I I the bathroom's like my favorite place to play when I'm trying out new um new zero waste brands and things because I just think there's something for everybody and there's something at every budget for everybody um and a lot of it is going back to what our grandparents would have done and sort of older ways of being mm. um you know, just even things like swapping to a solid soap bar obviously we've we've probably never all been through so much hand soap as we have in the last year but um a solid bar um will last twice as long as a, a liquid soap bottle and um uses 25% less carbon um, in its manufacture. Plus it doesn't come in as a plastic bottle that, that can't be recycled. So there's so many positives to, um, to perhaps simplifying all the stuff that we have in our bathroom. Yes, I mean, I, I hadn't really thought about it, but reading it, you mentioned those, dis those soap dispensers where they have a plunger that just can't be recycled because of the plunger element. And that is just incredibly wasteful. I know they look nice and they probably look nicer than a slightly slimy bar of soap, but it's it's um, a no brainer really, isn't it? At the end of the day. It's all, or refill it. If you're, if, if it's a pump, yeah. and that's that's all you want. You know, you can re get refills now direct to home. You can find refills mm. in zero waste shops as well. Um, so you don't have to always chuck out the plastic pump if you've already got it. But if you think about um, in terms of recycling, anywhere where you get a mix of plastic and metal, mm. so in a, in a pump or in a razor 
um, and some other things, it can't it can't be separated again. Um, no. We don't have the facilities, so those kind of things have to go straight in landfill, which might stop you wanting to buy them again. Mm -hmm. And in terms of, for example, ordering the bulk ordering loo roll, um, that would have to be delivered to you, wouldn't it? And and is it still greener in a way that, that it's got to do those miles on the road to get to you? There's, um, there's a big debate, especially around um, things like loo roll, um, about where they come from, how they're made and what they're made of. And there's, there's the air miles. And it is a bit of a balancing act of, so going, OK, well, it's made of certified recycled paper but it's got to come from further than Europe um you know or it's made of bamboo but it's coming from China or something so it's we need definitely we need more domestic products um in terms of like loo roll and kitchen roll and things and um, they're actually huge hugely impactful um and there are starting we are starting to see that change but um one of the things I think the book flags up quite a few times and we talk a lot on Pebble is it, we as consumers we, we, we can be quite conflicted you know it's not always easy to make a green choice because you're weighing up consequences the whole time and a lot of the brands and on our currents of legislation don't always make that the easiest job so occasionally it is a case of you know which is the more pressing concern for you and it's going to be different for, for other people and for your family situation and your financial situation um, but yeah it's it could be a lot easier <laughs> mm, okay um, I wanted to move to alcohol. Yes, I think a lot of alcohol. I mean, I'm on the I'm on the water today, but there's been a lot of alcohol consumed this last year, undoubtedly because people have been stuck in. They couldn't go out for meals. They can't go to the pub. They're a bit bored. Um, but specifically, wine um, is wine comes from all over the world, doesn't it? I mean, we, we all sort of look for wines from South America, wines from Australia, if, if we're into our wines. But is that bad for the planet, really? So there's there's a few different things to think about when it comes to wine. Um, I mean, who doesn't, you know, we need wine, basically. I would say it's necessity at this point <laughs> in, in the proceedings. Um, but there's lots of things that you can do to look for and reduce the impact of, of your, um, your Friday night drinks or your Sunday lunch drinks, whatever. Um, often when we're talking about um, vineyards and wine producers that, that produce on a huge scale, um, they can be responsible for a huge amount of pesticides. So in France, the amount of vineyards is around 3% of their agricultural land, but the amount of pesticides they use is 20% because people are looking to keep that quality year on year. And obviously winemaking is such a temperamental industry. Um, to guarantee quality of, of sort of mass produced wine is really, really difficult. So they, they refer to, they, they revert to a lot of pesticide use and a bit like, you know, how we don't really want massive farms only growing one thing, you know, this monocrop idea, you get the same when there's huge amounts of vineyards and nothing else. So what you want to be looking for is the small producers um, and words like low intervention or biodynamic or organic natural um, which all kind of mean the same thing. It basically means the farmers and the, the, the winemakers really have trying to work with the land they've got, with the, with the climate they've got and not add anything into the soil and not add anything into that, that, um, that process. And then you've got um, a lot of wine isn't vegan as well. So a lot of people have only sort of started to clock onto the fact that uh, some wines use a stabilizer called isinglass, which is made of fish bladders, which is lovely. Um, so that's a sulfate. So you want to look for wine that doesn't um, include sulfates or that is is sort of labelled vegan. And then also you, you like you you picked up on um, with the last question where it comes from is really important. So the British wine industry has never been better. I mean we're winning awards all over the world for like sparkling wines and whites and even reds now. So is there is there wine that you can drink from this country to cut down the carbon emissions? Um, and there's also a lot of debate in the wine industry about whether they can ever move away from the glass bottle idea, because that actually was 17th century or 18th century um, way of transporting wine. And actually, it's very outdated. It, it's beautiful and we're all very used to it. But the glass is incredibly heavy. So there are some um, wine suppliers moving to bags. I know we, we kind of used to scoff at the idea of wine in a bag, but actually it's, it's pretty decent now. Um, and then things like kegs and reusable um, and refillable systems. So you might even see wine in, on a tap in your zero waste shop in the future where you go and take your mm. bottle. So there's lots of different things to think about um, in terms of sort of buying wine. But 
especially the guys that are doing a really good job in, in producing biodynamic and organic wine definitely need our support so I would say definitely keep buying wine mm. um but yeah thinking about where it's coming from and who you're supporting with your money that's an idea that I come back to again and again in, in the book and, and in the magazine would it be more sustainable to buy a wine box then I mean then you've got plenty to go at of course but <laughs> but um I guess in terms of transporting etc is probably a better idea isn't it definitely bulk buying um almost anything is going to be better because it's less packaging and you're transporting you know a large amount of things once um and the sort of wine in boxes really are much much better than what we were used to sort of 10 or 20 years ago mm -hmm. i've even started seeing people doing gin in refillable sachets and um in a right. box as well so Gosh. yeah right it's a whole new well <laughs> I'm not encouraging alcoholism, I, I must admit, but um, yeah, there's a lot to think about there, definitely. Um, moving on to food, I'm, I'm, I'm reeling from what I was reading this morning because this humble item, you can see the humble avocado, I bought this one a week ago, actually it's a bit overripe and I might not even be able to use it, so I might have to waste it and put it in the compost bin, but I think this is going to be the last avocado I ever buy. Or consume and that. it's all Georgina's fault <laughs> and I, I wanted to ask her really about why some foods just aren't worth the carbon footprint that they create really. Well um, I mean first in the book and, and with Pebble we always try and give people other options um, you know we're not trying to tell people not to do stuff or, or to sacrifice things as, as you know the wine chat just just hopefully um, focused on but there are a few things that actually really aren't worth it and and the humble avocado <laughs> um one really is one of them <laughs> a bit like um you know talking about monocrops and when we all do one thing or when we the farms only grow one thing if we all eat a certain food stuff it really isn't good for the planet because it puts so much pressure on the area that that food stuff is grown in and in this case it's in mexico and so so many people now want avocados the farmers are basically selling off forested land um, so that they can plant more avocado trees and turn up you know it's, it's become a cash crop so it's causing deforestation um, there's a huge amount of um, emissions uh, around the transportation of avocados um, obviously they're so you know fragile and, and, and beautiful things but they need to be huge amounts of plastic and packaging um, and then like you said you know sometimes you don't even eat them or they they you can't use them um, so for what you get, it's it's just not worth the carbon footprint, um, unfortunately. And it's for me, it's one of the, the the slight issues around sort of moving everybody over to plant based eating and to, to vegan diets, which we do need to do to a point to reduce our, our consumption of meat and dairy. But just moving, just swapping over, not actually thinking about where those other ingredients come from, um, I think can be a bit short sighted, you know. Unfortunately, all food <laughs> has a carbon emission. Um, you know, it's not the fact that nothing does. So we just need to think about where that food is coming from um, and looking at how we can balance that with eating locally and seasonally, which is going to be the most sort of carbon efficient way of eating. Um, but yeah, sadly, the avocados, I think that's the one thing in the book I'm like, don't do this. <laughs> well, I didn't realise that, that avocados were grown in Mexico and that's just me being ignorant. I had no idea they were travelling so far. And it does seem ridiculous, doesn't it, that, that we are eating, obviously you expect things like bananas to be grown, you know, quite a long way away. But but for something like an avocado, I don't know. I don't know where I thought it was made. So and all the water that's used as well to grow yeah. them. Hugely water, um, they're huge, a hugely thirsty crop. Um, and this is this is the thing. It's not that people wake up wanting not to look after the planet it's just we haven't thought about this stuff for a long time you know we've all grown up with convenience and our foods being ever ready and ever present in the supermarkets mm. and we haven't had to think about where they come from um mm. but a lot of it is just it's 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 just not it's not even ignorance you know it's just not not thinking about it mm. um, and once you do sort of process where things come from and and how far they're coming and what they've got to do to keep them ripe and you know perfectly temperature controlled it just feels a bit nuts Mm, yeah, I agree. Um, I'm going to move on to, to coffee now. I'm sure quite a few of you have one of these, uh, a bamboo coffee cup, which I use regularly. Um, is that actually better than a disposable cup? You know, if we're nipping to Starbucks or whatever to get our daily coffee, is better so or worse? It's definitely better. Um, 
I know over the last year we haven't been able to use them. Um, I think some cafes are starting to let you use them now, but um, it's been very, I found it very frustrating, you know, trying to, uh, if you go out to support a local cafe and get takeaway coffee and I'm like, oh, I don't want the single use cup. Mm -hmm. um, the problem with the single use cups is A, the amount that we use of them. We use something like 100 million of them a year. It's, it's ridiculously large, um, but also what they're made of. So they're made of a paper kind of um, composite covered in plastic. And again, we I think we have one or two recycling facilities in the UK that can recycle them. Most can't. So when we're talking about those single use coffee cups, um, only 1% get recycled and the rest take 100 years to break down. So if you think how many we're getting through, mm. again, it's when you take these problems and, and sort of scale them up to the amount of people using them or, or, or abusing them is, is the problem. The reusable coffee cups are great as long as you do actually reuse them um they're not the cheapest thing to buy so i imagine most people are reusing them but uh the sort of the polypropylene which i think is probably the ones one like you hold up um you use, you need to use it around 20 times to work off the carbon emissions of its manufacture the steel ones are around 40 times so as long as you're having sort of a coffee a week in it then then yes absolutely is better but the reason i wanted to sort of um highlight that is again none of this stuff is is carbon has no carbon impact and there's a slight movement of, of people that are going you know almost like throwing out everything they've got and buying in all the new eco stuff which doesn't really help things either yeah. you know um so whatever you've got already in in whatever aspect that we're already talking about is probably the most sustainable thing okay i must talk my son out of buying these iced coffees that he keeps buying from the co-op and stacking up the cups in the kitchen awful <laughs> awful things um i'm sure that most of us have got a bag for life i know when i go off to do my weekly shop i've got several bags that i just reuse the whole time are they the greenest bags to use or we, we've all been made to think that plastic bags the, the supermarket plastic bag is like the worst thing we can possibly be used but is that the case yeah so bags again bags are an, an, a really interesting one um it's it's definitely along that same line of whatever you've got at the moment whatever you've got under the kitchen sink or hidden away in a cupboard i mean i've got bags of bags of bags all in a cupboard um that is the best thing to use and um, we none of us probably need to pick up another bag ever again um if we're also being honest um the single use plastic bags obviously we want to move away from those um about five trillion are made and used a year and even though we've cut down hugely in in the uk and other countries we still only recycle around one percent of them so it is the problem globally is enormous um but we've all sort of been sold this idea of the lovely tote you know the organic cotton tote bag and you know, it looks beautiful and things and it's much better that it isn't plastic and it will break down and biodegrade. But it's organic cotton is, is a hugely thirsty crop and there's not a lot of organic cotton. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to be using that tote bag about 130 times to work off sort of the growing of the cotton and the making it into the bag, which is enormous. I mean, that's that's a huge amount. Um, so if you've got a tote bag, do try and keep it um, in use rather than sort of picking up new ones or, or accepting new ones. Um, Reusable plastic bags, the bags for life, are a bit of a no. <laughs> They're a bit of um, a false economy, if you like. Um, so they are so they use 12 times more energy than the, the single use plastic bags and a lot more plastic. If you think how thick they are and they're meant to last for a long time. I think the idea behind them originally was brilliant. You know, you, you buy one and you take it back and you swap it for another when it breaks things. But in reality, most people don't do that. Most people might use them a couple of times, take them back to the supermarket a couple of times and then just get more if they forget them or use them mm -hmm. as a bin bag. You know, it's we, we don't use them in the kind of very pure way that they were designed to be used. And sadly, because they are so thick, they are a lot more, um, they do use a lot more energy. So again, it's one of those simple things where you think you're doing the right thing, but perhaps mm -hmm. it's not as, as green as you'd hoped. That's a bit worrying. I think I'm going to have to take a donkey to Lidl's and load it up every week or something. I don't know. Really. Yes, uh, but I, keep using it. Just keep using it. Absolutely yeah. the right thing to do. I do. Yeah. Uh, and you can stick them. You, well, it's, is it actually? I was going to say you can stick them in the washing machine, can't you? To wash them, but is that a bad idea? Because they give gosh, off plastic. 
um, before. <laughs> I, I would imagine they release microplastics mm. in the wash. Um, so maybe not, maybe wash them in cold water in a washing okay. up bowl. That's probably better than the washing machine. Um, right. Because okay. I, I don't know if, if it's helpful, but microplastics break off big, you know, the bigger bits of plastic or plastic in clothing um, when you have friction in the washing machine. So if you're tumble drying or if you're, you're washing clothes, those bits of plastic will just shatter and, and break into tiny, tiny pieces um, and enter the waterways. Um, so that's what we, okay. we talk about when we talk about microplastics. Right. Well, moving back to the home, I mean, better ways of heating our home generally, using less power, uh, any, any sort of tips on all of that side of things? Absolutely. So homes have become a bit of a passion for me at the minute um, because there's so much you can do. And this is why I get excited. There's so many ways you can bring down your carbon emissions and you can start to make a difference in your footprint. Um, obviously, we've all been stuck in our homes for the last year. So as much as we we think about office blocks being, you know, incredibly uh, carbon intensive or you know, we, we're not commuting to our offices as we were, um, they're actually like new offices are generally more more efficient, energy efficient than us all individually having our heating and our lighting on. Um, and there's around 25 million homes, I think, in the UK, and they account for around 15 percent of the UK's greenhouse gases. So that's that's quite massive. You know, if we're looking at the tiny things we can do in our homes, actually the home that we have it, it can be a big source of emissions and the stuff that we can do to tackle that. Um, so around 25% of our energy emissions we, uh, go out through the roof and about the same through the walls. So thinking about insulating roofs, lofts, um, any kind of space above us and our, our wall spaces is really important. But then there's really small things that you can do as well. So turning your thermostat down one degree will save 60 quid a year and also 310 kilograms of carbon. Um, and things like having reflective surfaces behind uh, radiators and covering your boiler with a sort of insulated padded jacket. These aren't hugely expensive things, but they again, they can save about 20 pounds a year each and around about 150 kilograms of carbon. So it doesn't all have to be big expensive um, statement things. It can be quite small changes inside um, and things like turning everything off on standby. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of this is kind of advice perhaps that your parents kind of shouted at you, <laughs> um, you know, turning light switches off, turning things off at the wall, um, but it does make a big difference. Um, modern electronics still use around 99% of their power when they're on standby. So we just turn, you know, turn them off at the wall um, is, is a really good habit to get into. And a lot of this stuff will start saving you money as well, which, you know, at, at the moment is, is ever more important. Absolutely. Yes, it will. Um, we, talking of money, I mean, we, some people will have money to invest or also we can look at using more ethical bank accounts which um, are investing in um, things like low carbon emissions. Any any advice on that? Yeah, definitely. And, and just before I, I do, I, I meant to say as well, for anyone that is interested in the car, in the home area, um, the Energy Saving Trust has the most amazing array of, of resources and helpful tips um, and also the Green Homes Grant, which um, I think is still going from the government, but that can give you £5,000 towards insulation and changes um, to your home. So there, there is help out there as well if you're, if you're looking at sort of say, um, changing things up at home. Um, the, the investment one and the money piece is actually, I think, really fascinating because, again, until maybe four or five years ago, not many of us were thinking about where our money was invested and that could be in pensions it could be in savings it could be in your your personal account and what the big banks were doing with it and we didn't have a huge amount of options um but nowadays the, the high street banks are being challenged by a lot of a lot of new online banks they're also being challenged by a lot of um green bond companies and different ways that you can personally start investing um in in greener companies so this thing called ESG investing, so environmental social governments, governance investing, has become a really big buzzword and a really big trend. And it basically means investing in companies that are doing good for the planet. So they're not investing in fossil fuels or fracking or arms or any, any of those lovely uh, industries. And it's become much more accessible for the individual person to start investing in it. So you've got things like, um, there's an app called Ticker, T-I-C-K-R, where you can invest um, as little as five pounds in different green companies. 
um, there are new green ices coming through, um, which again, you know, help you save money and make sure that your money um, is, is invested in ethical causes. There are um, different green pension offers. And then there is a lot of pressure as well on the high street banks to actually change up their investment models and move away from those big industries that they used to invest in like fossil fuels so if you're really concerned about this and you want to make sure your money is 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 a bit you know doing good for the planet while it's sitting there somewhere um then actually making you know checking out your own bank's sustainability policy and seeing what they're investing in can be a really good place to start um in terms of the high street the co-op and tri trio dos are the two most ethical um ethical banks to start with um so it can be as simple as switching your bank account and that's a huge mm -hmm massive thing to do um but would actually help save a lot of carbon emissions great okay i think one of the questions that is at the back of everybody's head particularly this year as we're all hoping to get away for holidays at some point is how damaging flying is um flying to other countries and is it something we should try to avoid um any any sort of solutions or ideas Oh, flying. <laughs> I, know. I don't remember flying. Um, yes, I mean, we can't get away from the fact that flying is hugely carbon intensive. Um, the aviation industry accounts for about 2% of the world's um, greenhouse gas emissions, um, about the same as commercial shipping. So there's a, there's a few different industries that, that do that. Um, and really, when you if you want to think about it from a personal point of view, one person flying to New York and back is the same carbon emissions as um, one person living in the developed world for a whole year. So it's it's probably one of the biggest, most impactful things you can do. Having said that, it isn't very realistic to tell everybody to stop flying, um, especially after the year we've we've had. A lot of people are desperate to get away and to see family and you know experience different things. So there are different ways that you can help to bring that impact down. Um, so. If you're thinking about flying, taking fewer and longer flight, um, sorry, fewer and longer holidays um, helps reduce the amount of flights that you're taking over the year. Flying direct, so um, you know, instead of doing short haul and lots of different layovers, flying direct is a lot more um, carbon intensive than than doing sort of hops. Most of the carbon emissions from a flight are in takeoff and landing, so just avoiding the going up and coming down bit is really good. Um, create it, taking less luggage with you. Um, obviously it burns more fuel, the heavier it is. Um, and actually they're not all airlines are equal and not all flights and planes are equal. So newer airlines and newer planes tend to use less CO2 and apps like Skyscanner um, actually tell you if you're looking at so five or six different flights, they will tell you which are the greenest flights to take. So you can start to sort of look and, 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 and choose, um, you know, something that's going to be slightly less. And then offsetting, which has had quite a rough, uh, bumpy uh, ride, I would say, in the last few years. But offsetting's really come on leaps and bounds. And there are some amazing companies um, doing a lot around agroforestry and tree planting um, when you're looking at offsetting your flights. Um, and there's a lot of carbon calculators out there so that they just work it out for you and you can pay a monthly subscription or a one-off sum to sort of offset any traveling that you're doing. So there are lots of different ways to kind of tweak the impact of your flight. You can't get around the fact that it's probably the most carbon intensive thing you might do all year. But, you know, I think we have to be realistic at this point and say people are going to fly. Um, but how can we how can we bring that down? And then obviously, if you, you know, trains, uh, trains, ferries, bikes, walking, all give you the most amazing holidays. Um, it doesn't have to be a plane journey for it to be a holiday. Um, so I actually was, uh, I actually wrote a book last year that's been delayed for a year, all about the best train travels, uh, train trips in Europe. And, um, that's going to be coming out next year. So that's, I'm super excited about, um, championing train travel in Europe at the moment as well. That's great, Georgina. Thank you very much. Just some, a real whistle stop uh, tour of your, <laughs> your book there. And, and, and there's a lot of really helpful information on your website what's the website address to just pebble dot oh so pebble magazine is pebblemag.com i'll put it in the chat um so okay. people can find it uh, but yeah we talk about everything on there from um we're doing a lot of like slow travel and british travel um talking about the best um, ethical fashion brands how to swap your you know your energy suppliers 
through to interviews with some of the most pioneering brands and, and sort of leaders in this space. So anything, any aspect of sustainable living that you're looking at, um, yeah, it's definitely a great resource. Great, thank you. Um, I noticed that somebody put in the chat, um, uh, Paul Bramley, uh, sorry, Paul Ramsey mentioned, why not use a thermos flask for your coffee? You know, you, I presume you could get job to put it in a thermos flask or take coffee from home in a thermos flask. It's a very good idea. You can get these little small cup thermos flasks now, which um, work really, really well, keep the coffee hot for a couple of hours. Uh, great if you're just going for a walk on your own and you fancy a cup of coffee halfway out so they work really well, well. And I, think, I think the last year has made us reassess what we need to be spending our money on and you know if you're walking from home yeah taking a coffee in a little I mean I've got one of those bottles that keeps drinks hot or cold yeah thermos I, I yeah. guess it's not called a thermos but it would be a thermos um and you know going back to making everything ourselves i don't that's where we need to be heading um so i think yeah. this year has given us a bit of a push in that direction and just made us think what you know from a convenience point of view what can we actually do at home that we used to just buy in or, or buy from a shop on the way so yeah that the best thing you can do is use something you've already got and that's that's yeah. a thermos. well i'm just having a look at one or two of the questions that people are asking um beatrice Asked, regarding laundry and cleaning products, is it really worth paying a lot more for certain subscription online companies that advertise themselves as green and better for the environment than the normal supermarket brands? So it depends what you're looking for, Beatrice. If you want to move away from, if you want to move towards, um, so move towards more natural detergents that are plant-based and will do less harm in, in the waterways, then definitely if you want to move to a brand that uses less plastic then definitely in terms of price there are quite a few different models out there and small s m o l and splosh are two of the, the best ones i found um, they come in like cardboard boxes and fit in your letterbox um, in terms of cost i think small and splosh actually aren't that much more expensive than a not a supermarket owned brand but a sort of personal or, or aerial kind of um, option um so i yeah i use um splosh and small um for various different things um but do look into brands when they're if they're sort of targeting you around the internet and, and calling themselves green and ethical do pop on their website and just check and see what they mean by that and what they're doing because there are quite a few people now you know pretending they're a bit greener than they really are right okay <laughs> um sorry uh somebody called ian um a big concern for me due to its impact and lack of general awareness is the widespread use of palm oil. Sustainable or not, the demand for this product will see further destruction of the world's tropical climates and rainforests, since this is the only climate palm grows in. It's 50% of supermarket products. How can we raise awareness of this huge issue, especially since the derivatives of palm oil have hundreds of names and it's very hard to recognize? Um, Ian, it's a really, really good question. And you've kind of nailed all the points that make it really difficult. It is in so much of our food and also our skincare as well, which people don't realise. Um, and it isn't always uh, easy to find because, as you, as you rightly pointed out, it comes in lots of different names. But it's often found in, in pre you know, in heavily produced uh, foodstuffs, in ready meals, in biscuit, things like that. So looking at anything that's been super, super manufactured and trying to move away from those types of products really, really helps. Um, and also so buying, I don't know, whether it's organic brands or locally based and, and made brands um, and choosing products from those people instead of the big mass market and global names, again, would really help. Um, in terms of skincare, the same thing really choosing to, to to work with brands that you can see it's been like handcrafted or made in a small batch or made locally um, and all these different sort of um, ethical sort of signifiers that, that show that they're not using um, palm oil. There's also quite a few brands that are really shouting about not using palm oil like Doisy and Dam uh, dark chocolate um, and there's also quite a lot of skincare guys I know that are really proud that they don't use it um, and there's also an app called Gicky G-I-K-I -I, and that's an app you can download on your phone and you can scan products in the supermarket and it will tell you if it contains palm oil um, so that's a really good way to sort of have in your, in your, in your pocket um, if you're really unhappy about palm oil and it's a hugely controversial and difficult problem but yes we need to start getting rid of palm oil 
um, talk to the brands that you love the most. Are they using it? You know, do they have a plan to get rid of it? Are they going to phase it out? The more consumer pressure we can put on the people that use it and make them realize that actually enough of us don't want them to be using it anymore is, is still a really important thing to do. Um, one other thing the book comes back to and, and the magazine goes to a lot is this idea that we have a lot of power as consumers and we're always told that individuals can't make a difference, but it's it's not true at all. We make a really big difference. And when we're vocal and when we put pressure and when we come together, we actually have a huge sway in, in what brands do. Um, ultimately, they only make products and they're only successful because we buy them. So if we change that behavior, they have to follow suit. Um, so yeah, putting pressure on the people that make those products, um, it, it can feel tiny and it can feel like David and Goliath, but it does make a difference. Thank you. Uh, Michelle was asking, are cotton shopping bags better than plastic bags? I know we did touch on this earlier, but overall, would you um, think that they are? I think, yeah, overall, I think they are. I mean, for me personally, I, I think they're better because they don't obviously contain plastic and they will biodegrade. Um, what we just, what I think people perhaps aren't always conscious of is those cotton bags don't just, just you know, appear from nowhere they're made of resources they're made by people that crop has to be grown so it still has a, an, an impact and a footprint um but yes i would i would say they are because everything that um i feel very passionate about is, is reducing plastics from from whatever resource or industry that we can um but i'm having researched the book i'm now quite conscious of not picking up any more tote bags um, yeah. I probably don't need another one ever so I think uh yeah it just being conscious of you know your own consumption of whatever it is, is is really important you could you could get yourself a Huddersfield Literature Festival um cotton tote bag actually if anybody would like one we have plenty uh Vicky Horner um has asked a question which I I was interested in in fact actually was researching it earlier on um when it comes to eco-friendly cleaning are there any alternatives to bleach that work just as well oh I know a lot of people use various combinations of bicarb of soda and lemon um in terms of like being the kind of stripper away of all things it depends what you're using the bleach for um i don't know is the answer to that i'm gonna have to find out and come back to you there's nothing i've seen that's been like a plant version but i would imagine that's because bleach is so caustic mm. nothing else is going to be exactly the same but depending on what you want to use it for there might be a sort of diy um natural version um if you let us know what you, i mean if you're putting it down the loo i i'm not sure there is but there seem to be some products I was looking at, I can't remember the names of them now, which claim to be able to sort of get the smell and the stains out of dishcloths and, and things that you can add to your wash to, yeah. to keep things whiter, but, but they are, you know, they're, they're not, they haven't, they're not full of nasty chemicals as I say, I'd, I'd have yeah. to go back and have a look, but yeah, I think if you Google it, Vicky, you might find a few alternatives, it might be worth trying. Yeah, there's, I mean, if there's um, people like Clean Living and also people, um, Eco Eggs are pretty good for your laundry to getting out like really good mm. stains. Um, they're like a plastic egg that you reuse full of pellets um, yeah. and the pellets um, react with each other as, as the wash goes on and they, they sort of remove a lot of stains. And you can catch microplastics, can't you, in... Is there something um, you can put in the wash which catches microplastics as well? Yes, yeah, so you can get them. It's called a guppy bag and it's made of an incredibly fine mesh. Um, and you basically put everything that you're going to put in the wash in that bag first and it will catch the microplastics. I mean, we're talking under five millimeters, so they're pretty much invisible to our eyes. Um, but the guppy bag is, is meant to be used by a lot of different people as, as a best in class thing to try for microplastics. Um, there are a lot of washing machine manufacturers that are bringing in microplastic filters into new washing machines, but they're not they're not there yet. Okay. Um, questions pouring in now. Thank you, everybody. Uh, my next. Sorry, this is Susan. My next car. Should it be a hybrid, petrol, electric, etc.? Which type really is the greenest? Um, it's an electric car. Um, this is like 20 questions. <laughs> Uh, in an electric car, hybrids actually are again a bit of a greenwashing issue because people again, it, in reality, people don't always use things the way they're meant to be used or in the best practice way. Um, and hybrids have a very small engine, um, and then 
you're meant to just use that if your electricity sort of runs out and you're halfway down the motorway. Um, but that's generally not how people use them. They kind of forget to top them up on the electric and just use the engine. So the electric's uh, a lot better. And again, there's a huge variety of um, different electric cars that have come in and, and price points and everything else. Um, and again, electric cars do have a carbon footprint. Um, there's a lot of issues around the mining for the batteries that, that are needed. Um, but again, that is something that we're working through. It's still such a new industry. There's lots of different, different alternatives coming through and um, different ways forward. But yeah, if you can afford to move to electric, which we are all going to have to do in the next 10 years anyway, um, then yeah, it's, it's an amazing thing to do. Uh, Vicky Horner again was asking any advice for talking to friends and family about eco living. I have a few family members who are very naive about their impact or get angry about things. Is there a good way to talk to them about these important issues without coming across like I'm telling them off? <laughs> <laughs> um, don't do it after a few glasses of wine. Um, I say that from experience. <laughs> um, I, I actually, I, this comes up quite a lot and I think there's a, there's a small section of people who are very passionate about sustainable living who can come across quite intense and you know um i think no one wants to be lectured and that actually the way to get people on side is never to tell them off and to lecture them you know sort of bashing them over the head with something isn't isn't, isn't the way to get them to to love something that, that you want them to love but i do find money is a really good way of talking about the um the issue without addressing the issue head on everybody wants to save money especially at the moment um and it really works to get people thinking about things that perhaps they might drag their feet if they thought there was an eco angle or perhaps they aren't um they don't want to confront some of the sort of the quite scary facts and figures that that we can be talking about um but i find if you address things take the eco angle almost out and, and put the financial angle in that can help the conversation get started mm -hmm. Um, and ultimately, we want people to change their behaviours. Why they change that behaviour almost doesn't matter. If someone's mm. only doing it to save themselves money, doesn't matter. Who cares? You know, they're changing. Yeah. So, I think um, a, a, a good starting point is perhaps talking to people about green energy suppliers, um, because that's such an easy way of saving a lot of money and, and you know, lowering so your carbon footprint. One click now. And I know we didn't really talk about renewable energy um, earlier when we were talking about the home, but you know people are so aware now of renewable energy and it's so quick and easy to swap um and you, there's a lot of um different plans now that can help you with the different topics month on month and make it more like a game or make it you know ways to get the whole family involved um so i think trying to make it mm. fun get the kids researching well. it for you maybe <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get it, you know giving rewards for, for people changing things or kids donating toys or, or using less um, of certain things um they're trying to get as many people involved as, as, a, as a collaborative effort rather than sort of telling them off i think is is really important um jean tallis said uh, isn't offsetting your flight the same as the medieval idea of indulgences sorry i don't know what that means uh jean but is it is it just a cop out for rich people in the west basically um, I think Jean's got a point. Um, it can be used as a kind of get out of jail free card. I think it's, but I think really that's the kind of 1% that are flying around the world on private jets and then kind of, you know, throwing their weight behind an ethical campaign. That really winds me up and I'm sure it, <laughs> it sounds like it does Jean as well. Um, I think, you know, in an ideal world, none of us would be flying and therefore not have to do the offsetting and the offsetting isn't a kind of guilt free you know, oh, it's fine to fly five times a year because I've offset my flights. But if you are going to fly, and at this point we have to accept there are going to be lots of people flying this year, then offsetting is, is a really good thing to do as well as um, is better than not doing it. Um, so, yeah, just trying to get people to think about, A, the impact that they're having um, and whether it's worth it, whether they can get around it, and also putting something back um, in whatever way um, they can. Is, is really important. So it's not a solution by any means, um, but we might as well do it. <laughs> okay. Natalie's asking, I've heard a lot of conflicting information on whether organic is really better when it comes to food. Some say it doesn't really do anything for the environment and can cause more harm, but at the same time, it's being touted as the best way to buy. Um, was it Natalie? Sorry. Um, uh, Natalie, yes. Yeah, Natalie. Um, there's a lot in the book about this um, because it's an ongoing debate. Um, 
I personally believe, and I, I've read a, a, an awful lot of research and sort of books around it, that organic is the way to go. It uses a lot less um, chemicals on the land. It, it's all about biodiversity and um, making sure the land is usable um, in the next 100 years or, or so on, um, as opposed to the big industrial farming, where actually that's the thing I think a lot of people, that's where a lot of our problems are coming from, these massive industrial farms um, you know, that are incredibly problematic in terms of waterways and land use and, and animal welfare as well. Um, so on the organic side, making sure that you know, soil health is a priority, making sure that biodiversity is a priority, making sure that animals are well looked after and, and have nice, you know, have good lives, um, I think is really important. Um, and also from a personal health point of view, making sure that the food that you eat isn't um, genetically modified and covered in pesticides. For me, I, I, I prefer that. I totally understand that organic food isn't the cheapest and you know quite often I can't afford to buy organic everything that I want I sort of pick and choose depending on what what's going on in the supermarket um but there are lots of sort of ways that you can you can bring down the cost um and also yeah I think it's it's a personal decision for, for you as well I think trying to get everybody doing the same thing that's not in my version of sustainable living we've all got to sort of find where our red lines are and what's more mm -hmm. important to us so there might be another issue that you care a lot more about and sort of want to start there with your focus um we just hit four o'clock are you happy to answer a few more questions georgina because i've got some yeah, more coming in happy to have me lovely thank you yes we are definitely um we have an anonymous um participant here uh have you done any work on compostable compostable packaging I keep seeing it advertised as green, but it can spoil batches of plastic recycling if it's put in the waste that waste stream. Often can't be put in the home compass because either. So it doesn't seem like a particularly good thing. Oh, composting. Yes, you're <laughs> right. <laughs> Basically, it's composting. The, the compostable versus biodegradable debate seems to be the new area of greenwashing. Um, lots of companies companies are sticking the word biodegradable um, or compostable in front of their products and often what it means is that it will break down in an industrial composter we have five of these in the UK that's it so unless you know your recycling is going to one of those five industrial composters yes it will spoil batches of recycling and our recycling levels are really rubbishly low at the minute as well um, they unless it's sort of it's mandated on the box that it is suitable for home compost it won't break down in your garden either um, and a lot of the compostable materials are still made of what's called bioplastics so um, it, they will still break down into microplastics so yes it's a hugely problematic term um, there are some good people out there that are, are making things that will compost at home so for instance a lot of tea bags used to have plastic in them and the last few years we've seen an awful lot of people move away from from using plastic and making sure your tea bags will actually break down in your compost bin. Um, but for a lot of packaging, it's it's becoming a big, um, yeah, a big greenwashing issue. Definitely check the website of the brand that you're using or, or talking about and seeing what they say in the small print. Email them um, or, or contact them on social media and ask them to confirm um, exactly how the product breaks down, exactly what it's made of. Um, if they're not transparent with you, then yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't be buying with them um or spending money with them but we all need to move away from plastic packaging and there are some really good people trying to find alternatives um but it's just a case of where those alternatives are actually better in the long run um and what impact they have as well uh, paul ramsey is asking how damaging is the increased use of soya beans in vegan diets in terms of where it's grown and damaging natural habitats Gosh, um, we're really getting into the nitty gritty, and these are these are really complex questions. So um, I I won't I can give you a top line in a few minutes. Um, we're I don't want you. you have to be the font of all knowledge here. I'm afraid, yeah. Georgine. Um, this is this is why we we haven't solved the climate emergency um, because it's incredibly complex and interconnected, and um, people far cleverer than me uh, of working on it for decades. Um, Yes, so more and more, more and more of us are eating vegan or plant-based diets, which is great in one aspect. Um, but like I was talking about with the avocados earlier, just swapping to um, vegan-based products which are made of soy can have an unintended 
consequence because again soy is becoming a cash crop it grows very quickly it grows in sort of tropical environments and we we're losing like heritage forests and rainforests as people cut it down to make room for soy farms to fuel that demand so it is a problem um yes but most soy products aren't made for human consumption they're made for animal consumption so this is where I'm talking about how complex and interconnected everything is. So actually by reducing the number of animals that we eat um, and need on the planet at any one time, we will reduce that soya um, usage as well. So it's half of one and six, you know, it does half dozen of the other at the minute. Um, but I think it's something like under 10% of all soya grown is used for human consumption and pretty much three quarters of the rest is, is for sort of animal um, animal consumption. And we go through like a billion chickens a year and something scary of, of, of cows as well. Um, I need to check the book for a minute. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's not an easy solution. Um, we need to find something that is vegan friendly and also not made of soy. And Lucy's asking, with teenagers in the house, how do I get them to turn things off? Are there monitors that can target a room so that I could pop up pocket money in return for them saving electricity, perhaps? Um, I feel like this is where actually things like smart technology come into their own, um, where you can program plugs to come on and off at different times and set thermostats and um, turn various different electronics off. So maybe that's the way to go. Um, because you can program them all as being so voice activated or activated from your phone. Um, so you've got control over, over the lights and the electricity and the, and the, the temperature. Um, as well, there's also um, programs like, I mentioned Giki earlier, which is an app, but the same company do a website called Giki Zero. Um, and they're trying to get people to sign up to cut a ton of CO2 um, in 21. So cut a ton in 21 on average but every person in the uk gets to about nine tons a year but what they the, how they do it is through tiny steps so agreeing to not fill the kettle all the way to full when you want one cup of water or um pledging to turn off things when you go to bed and it gives you awards and it gives you um you know it's more like a game and i feel like something like that might be something you can all do together um, and see if that works because you you get rewarded for for different aspects of of sustainable living that you do. Um, I'll put the I'll put the name in the chat for you. Um, I think it's Giki Zero. And we do have more questions, and I think we can probably go through today. And I'm very grateful to everybody for uh, contributing because it makes for a, a really interesting chat. Just one final one from uh, I, I've missed the name of who it was from. I'm afraid, but what would you, if you had one top tip today that we could all go away with, any idea um, for what that would be? One, just one thing, um, go and do a carbon calculator. It's really simple, um, lots of them online and it will tell you how much carbon on average you're using in whatever setup you've got, what family financial setup you've got. And then you can start to think about how you can reduce it. But I always think arming yourselves with the facts and the knowledge to start with helps you work out what you're going to go and target um, mm -hmm. and, and how to bring that down because just bringing everybody's carbon emissions down a little bit is 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 the way forward. Well thank you so much Georgina. Um, just a reminder if you want to to get hold of the book it's on the, all the usual platforms. We also have a couple of booksellers that we work closely with, Reed Bookshop in Homeforth and Fox Lane Book as well if you look on our website you'll see those bookshops there and they'll be more than happy to source the book for you and probably even hand deliver it if i know read uh so so do have a look rather than going straight to amazon please um and and also please go to our huddersfield literature festival website which is huddlitfest.org.uk to see what's on for the rest of the week so quite a few events you can book into thank you so much georgina it's been fascinating it's a great book an absolutely essential book. It's one I'm going to be buying for presents for people this year, definitely. And I hope that the audience here get oh, to read it. You. Well, thank you so much for having me. And um, hopefully it, it's given people a few different thoughts in different directions or spurred a few ideas. So um, thank you so much. And I, you know, the book isn't about being doom and gloom. It's about sort of embracing what we can do to, to make change. And I think that's exciting. Um, so thank you so much for having me. And hopefully I've helped some, some dilemmas today as well. <laughs> 
thank you everybody for coming and uh, see you at the next event. Bye. Thanks.